Joe is here to uh, present to us and give us the title of the presentation today, The Propaganda War, How the Two Koreas Use the Power of Rhetoric to win favor with each other's citizens. Uh, Yako is born in the Netherlands and raised in Australia. Uh, he has lived in Korea for over 20 years with a broad range of work experience in the communication, legal, tourism, training and broadcasting sectors. So currently, Yako works as a content creator for Inside Communications Consultants, hosts a weekly interview podcast about North Korea, and moderates panel discussions for Economist Intelligence Corporate Network, part of the Economist Group. Yako is fluent in Korean, has a deep knowledge of contemporary Korean history, is an active member of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea, and leads occasional walking tours of historic sites in Seoul. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Korean Studies from Leiden University, a Bachelor of Arts in Asian Studies from Monash University, and a separate Bachelor of Arts in Modern European Studies and German Language from the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Mr. Yeah. Okay, mic check. Is the mic working? Good, all right. Got the thumbs up there. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you at Dulwich College today. Uh, my name is Jacko Zwetsut, and I, uh, today I'll be talking about the propaganda war between the two Koreas. I'm going to start with a general overview of what propaganda is and how it's used in Korea. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some examples of propaganda leaflets from both North Korea and South Korea uh, that the two Koreas have used against each other. So that'll go for about an hour. I hope I can keep your attention during that time. At the end of my presentation, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So, uh, who am I? Well, you've already heard a little bit about who I am, but uh, most important and relevant to today's presentation is that I am the host of a weekly podcast uh, for NK News, which you can find at nknews.org. NK News is the world's only news agency focusing specifically on North Korea. Right, so my colleagues report on everything that happens in and around and in relation to North Korea. And every week I talk to somebody who knows something uh, interesting uh, or unusual about North Korea. And that conversation, that interview becomes the NK News podcast. I've been doing that now for four and a half years. We have more than 250 episodes online. So if you're interested in learning more about North Korea, I do encourage you to go and check it out. I also, uh, for my master's thesis, I wrote a, uh, a long paper about North Korean graphic novels. What's a graphic novel? It's a nice word for a comic book. So I basically studied comic books for my master's thesis, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and I researched propaganda, and that's what brings me here today. How did that begin? Way back in 1996, when I first came to Korea, I was teaching English on the border, uh, very close to the demilitarized zone up in Paju in uh, northern Gyeonggi province. And uh, one night I was going through the TV channels and that was before I had cable. So I just had a very few TV channels. Uh, and suddenly I saw a TV channel that wasn't supposed to be there. And it was a North Korean television on my TV here in South Korea. Now, normally the South Korean military has a jamming signal to block North Korean TV from coming into South Korea, but where I was living was so close to the demilitarized zone that the jamming signal didn't work properly, and I was able to pick up North Korean television at my house. Coincidentally, at the same time, I was reading the book Animal Farm by George Orwell, and I thought, wow, this is what I'm watching on TV. This is like the real animal farm here. This is the real uh, communist society trying to send messages to South Korea saying, we're the better place. You should come and join us. You should be like us. And so for a few hours each day, uh, that was broadcast on my TV. And of course, at that time, I didn't speak much Korean. So I would look at it for a few minutes and then get bored and then switch back to uh, the other TV channels. Then in 1999, I was teaching English at another school, this time in uh, Gimpo. Gimpo was a county just beyond Gimpo Airport, also in Kyonggi Province. And in the staff room, there was a box that looked like this box here. And 
I looked up in my dictionary to see what it said on the box and it said seditious propaganda materials collection box. And I thought, wow, what's that all about? So I asked the headmaster what's in that locked box, because as you can see, well, you can barely make out, it's padlocked. And I asked the headmaster, what's inside that box? And she said, those are all propaganda leaflets that, uh, from North Korea that the children have picked up on their way to school and handed in to their teacher. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. Can I have a look? And she said, yes. And she gave me the key and I unlocked the box and had a look at all these different leaflets from North Korea. And then, of course, I had to put them back in the box because once or twice a month or maybe less frequently, the whole box was handed over to the local police station and they did something uh, with all those leaflets there. But that's what started the long journey of fascination with propaganda, not only from North Korea, but also from South Korea. Okay, before I get into the meat of the topic, a couple of caveats and disclaimers. First of all, the leaflets that I'm showing today, I don't own them, I don't have them in my possession. Uh, the images that I'm going to show today are all found on the internet. Uh, and I'm not here to make any political statements. I'm here to talk about propaganda as a messaging tool that's used by governments all around the world uh, at various times. And I'm also not, to, uh, not trying to compare the merits or demerits of the systems and governments of the two Koreas, uh, simply talking about their propaganda use and their messaging. All right, uh, I mentioned before that I wrote a, a master's thesis about North Korean graphic novels, so I thought I'll show you what comic books in North Korea look like, because most people don't know that comic books actually exist in North Korea. So each year, somewhere between 20 and 50 uh, comic books are published in North Korea. And like every book in North Korea, they go through uh, the approval process of the North Korean government. There are no independent publishers, there are no underground uh, comic book publishers, they're all through the, uh, the the government and they're all printed at the government printing house uh, in Pyongyang. So these are some covers of uh, North Korean comic books and sometimes the storylines are uh, pre-modern so you can see some of the, uh, the pre-modern uh, haircuts and costumes. Uh, sometimes they're about animals who walk and talk and act like humans uh, and sometimes they're about Korean war stories that seems to be quite a, a favorite. Now, oh, I should point out this word here at the top, this Korean word, kurimchek. Kurimchek literally means picture book. Uh, now, in South Korea, the word manhwachek is used for a, a comic book. Uh, and if you're familiar with comic books from Japan or the comic book culture from Japan, the word manga is the same, uh, or the Japanese equivalent of manhwa in South Korea. Now, in North Korea, they don't use manhwachek. They don't say that word. They instead use the word kurimchek, meaning picture book. So they have a, a very different word for it. And that word, kurimchek, uh, actually incorporates or encompasses two types of comic books. The first one looks like a comic. So on the inside, you'll see that there are multiple pictures per page. And when people speak, there are speech balloons that come from their mouth. Uh, and, and that's how the story is told. It, what we understand as a comic book or graphic novel, that's one type of kurimchek. But not all kurimchek look like this. Some look more like this. Just one picture on the page and one paragraph of text underneath. So when you look at the cover of a North Korean comic book or kurimchek, you can't actually tell is this a real comic or is it a one picture and one slab of text with no uh, speech balloons. We can't tell from the cover. You have to actually look inside. Okay, so what's interesting about North Korean comic books? First of all, the purpose of a North Korean comic book is not just to entertain the children, the teenagers, and the young adults of North Korea. They're not there just to be fun. And the reason for that is because North Korea rejects the idea of art for art's sake. Right? The, uh, the former leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, who's now dead, he wrote a book on fine arts. And in that book, he talked about uh, art for art's sake. It's not something we accept in North Korea. Art must serve a purpose. It must serve the interests of the state. It must serve to edify the masses. So, what is the purpose? Uh, in North Korea, every piece of literature, including comic books, it must teach a message. It must somehow give uh, an idea to the people that the state wants them to have. And that message is uh, a propaganda tool. 
And what does it do? What comic books actually shape the worldview of young North Koreans. They teach North Koreans these are, uh, this is what good people are like and this is what bad people are like and this is what we are supposed to do in society. So they kind of model the behavior, uh, good and bad behavior, that uh, people should learn from. And uh, so to give an example, in a, a comic book about the Korean War, you'll usually find four basic character types. You'll find the very brave and uh, fearless uh, and loyal North Koreans. And then you'll find the cowardly and venal South Koreans. You'll find the evil, big-nosed Americans. And you'll find the even more evil uh, Japanese former colonists of Korea. So those are the four major character types that you find in North Korean comics. And that's the worldview that young North Koreans are given from very early on. Uh, and that's how they get their entree into uh, the North Korean understanding of the world. So that then brings us to the topic of what is propaganda? What is it and what does it do? Basically, it's spreading a message, right? The noun propaganda is related to the verb to propagate, which means to spread something, uh, to put a message out there and convey it to a large audience. Uh, the most famous book that I can think of on, uh, or influential book on propaganda is Jacques Ellul. He was a French man back in the 1960s. He wrote the very first sort of serious study of propaganda called Propaganda, the Formation of Men's Attitudes. If he was writing that today, he would probably say, uh, give the title Propaganda, the Formation of People's Attitudes. But back then, uh, they're a bit more uh, not so inclusive in their language. Anyway, here's a couple of quotes from that book. Propaganda by its very nature is an enterprise for perverting the significance of events and insinuating false intentions. That means giving a, uh, a spin or a twisted meaning to events and hinting at the intentions that the writer of the propaganda wants you to have. Hate, hunger and pride make better levers of propaganda than love or impartiality. And we certainly see that in North Korean comic books. They try to evoke feelings of hate, hunger, pride, also fear. I would include fear in that group as a lever of propaganda. Uh, and the aim of modern propaganda is no longer simply to modify ideas, to give you something uh, to, uh, to believe in, but to provoke action. Right, so it's more than just giving an idea, it's about provoking an action. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into uh, the leaflets. So why should we study propaganda? Why, why look at that? Well, as citizens of this world, and uh, you young people are going to become citizens and leaders of the world in the future, we must be aware of the different ways that governments and corporations try to influence our thoughts and our actions. And we have to recognize propaganda when we see it. And then when we recognize it, we should use our critical thinking to determine, is this a true message? Is this a useful message? What's right for me? And of course, that doesn't mean don't trust anybody. It doesn't mean be unbelieving of everything. It simply means be aware so that as a, a citizen, you can make up your own mind and uh, be a modern, global, democratic citizen. Okay, now in Korea, or on the Korean Peninsula, there are two Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. Each one has, over the decades since the Korean War, used different ways of messaging, different kinds of propaganda, to try to influence people on the other side to say, hey, we're the better ones. And that's what I'll be going into uh, shortly. So there are different forms of government propaganda. Newspaper articles, that's one of the oldest techniques, is a government will write something and have it printed in a newspaper. Of course, radio and television broadcasts. Between TV shows, you'll see public, uh, public service messages telling you, for example, uh, always wear a mask, uh, drive safely, etc. These are kinds of messages that the government gives to us. Also, there are rallies and demonstrations. Normally, when we think of rallies and demonstrations, we think of uh, activities organized by people who disagree with the government. But governments can also organize rallies and demonstrations in support of government activities. And then there's the internet. There's also uh, official government websites. Every ministry has its own website. The, uh, the government of a country has its own website. Often embassies have websites as well, as, as well as Twitter accounts uh, and, and Instagram pages. So these are other ways of getting messages out. 
And there are posters. North Korea is full of posters. I'll show you an example in a moment. Leaflets and loudspeakers. And I'll talk a little bit, uh, bit more about that later on. Now, when you've got a message, when you have propaganda, there must be a target. Who are you trying to reach? Who are you trying to convince? And there are two major groups of targets of propaganda. There's the inside group and there's the outside group. So insiders can include citizens of your country. Right? So to give an example, uh, the, the government of this country w tries to persuade people about things in this country. That's an, an example of an inside target. Also, members of the ruling party. Right? You've got to get a message out to convince people in the party uh, that this is the right way to go. Children. We just talked about comic books earlier, how they are a target for propaganda because they have to be taught what to believe about the world and the people in it. And the diaspora. The diaspora is a word meaning people who belong to this group but live outside this country. So an example is uh, Korean Americans, Korean Chinese, Koreans in Russia, Korean Japanese. These are the Korean diaspora around the world. And also opposition groups in an enemy country. So if you're trying to uh, find people who support you, you sometimes look at enemy groups in, or sorry, opposition groups in an enemy country. And that might be hard to understand, but I'll, I'll give you an example of that later on. And then we have outsiders as well. And outsiders are potential defectors, people who might cross over from the other country or the other side to your side. Members of an opposing party, people who don't like your message, you have to try to convince them that you're right. And also enemies, uh, such as in wartime. And I'll have an example of a, a wartime leaflet later on. So here are some examples of internal North Korean propaganda. Here's how the North Korean government show, uh, plays its messages to people within North Korea. On the top left, we have the North Korean state newspaper, the Rodong Shinwon, that comes out every day. Top right, we have North Korean central television. The bottom left, we have an example of a rally, a street demonstration in support of the North Korean government. And on the bottom right, we have an example of a North Korean poster, which was uh, about um, uh, anti-disease spreading. So uh, quarantine and disease control. It's obviously a, a Corona era poster. And with this word here, is Shindangyol, that means single-minded unity or uh, one-hearted solidarity. It's the most common uh, propaganda phrase all throughout North Korea. So these are internal propaganda. These are for the people within North Korea. Then we have examples of external North Korean propaganda. On the top left, we have an example of a, a YouTube video. North Korea produces YouTube videos. Now, if you know anything about North Korea, you'll know that people inside North Korea don't have access to the internet. They can't use YouTube. They can't use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those things. So why would they produce YouTube videos? These are for people outside North Korea. And it, uh, this young girl, she's about uh, nine or 10 years old, and she, uh, her name is Songa, and she makes videos in English with a very British accent uh, explaining how great life is in North Korea. Now, she doesn't do this by herself. She does this uh, at the instigation of the North Korean government. So that's an example of external North Korean propaganda. On the top right, we have this website, Uri uh, Minjokiri. That's a website which is produced by the North Korean government targeting South Koreans or Koreans outside North Korea. So Koreans in China, Koreans in Japan, Koreans in Russia, Koreans in America. These are the targets of that website. At the bottom left, we have example of four leaflets also used to target Koreans outside North Korea. These are leaflets that are sent to South Korea, and I'll tell you how in a moment. And then North Korea also has radio stations broadcast into South Korea, like the Voice of Salvation, the Gugu Gesori. Uh, it's a uh, radio station that pretends to be located within South Korea, but it's actually broadcasting from Kaesong into South Korea to try to convince people here that the North Korean government is right. Now, what about some examples of external South Korean propaganda? Here's a South Korean leaflet from way back in 1986. South Korean leaflets at that time, the major target were North Korean soldiers, just north of the demilitarized zone. So they often used pretty girls to convince the North Korean soldiers 
come to South Korea and you'll get a girlfriend who looks like this. And on the right side, you'll see there, there's the logo of the 1986 Asia Games that took place in South Korea. And so it is actually an invitation to North Koreans, come south, cross the border, and you can participate in the Asia Games. And on the right, bottom right here, we have an example of loudspeakers. This is a more recent photograph, I think from 2015 or 2016. Uh, at home, you might have a, uh, a loudspeaker to, uh, to play your television on or to play your music on, but here we see a whole lot of loudspeakers together in a giant array, and that is to literally blare uh, music and uh, news and weather information across the demilitarized zone into North Korea. Because we know that North Korean soldiers can't listen to South Korean radio, so the South Korean government used these loudspeakers to play that sound very loudly uh, over the, the land and into North Korea. Okay, so when were propaganda leaflets first used in North Korea? So I have to go way back in history, actually, to 1945. At the end of the Second World War, the American planes flew over Seoul and dropped leaflets from the airplanes, telling people, okay, the war is over, Japan has lost, the Allies have won, uh, everybody stay calm, uh, the Americans will be here soon, uh, don't go out there uh, killing and hurting Japanese people, just stay calm and keep peace, keep order, basically basically was the, the message in the first uh, series of propaganda leaflets that were dropped over Seoul. And then later, a couple of years later, during the Jeju uprising in April 1948, uh, the US military government used or authorized leaflets that were dropped over, uh, over Jeju Island when there was a, uh, a fight between uh, communist insurgents and the, uh, the American military government. So they dropped leaflets there, basically telling people to give up. And then later that same year, in October, 1948, after the uh, South Korean government had been set up, leaflets were dropped over the Yosu Sunchon area during the rebellion in those two cities, also telling people basically, give up, it's useless, you can't win. Then things really took off in the Korean War. The United Nations forces dropped, and you can see this number here, I put all the zeros in there deliberately just to give you a sense of the size of it, two billion leaflets, more than two billion leaflets, were dropped over the South Korean and North Korean area during the Korean War. And that is, if you think about it, that's enough to cover the whole Korean peninsula with paper. It's a lot of leaflets that were spread. And at its peak time, more than 20 million leaflets were printed and cut and put into airplanes each week. So massive amounts of leaflets were used to try to convince people on the other side, hey, uh, stop fighting, uh, or come over and join our side, or go back to your home village, uh, that sort of thing. Now, how were they delivering leaflets? Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, in 1945, leaflets were simply dropped from airplanes in the early days. But then, later on in the Korean War, they started using these empty cluster bomb container. Right? So basically, it's a bomb with no explosive, and inside, we have these rolls of paper. You could fit 22,500 leaflets into this empty cluster bomb container, and then drop that from an airplane, and then in the air, the container would flip open and all the paper leaflets would fly out and cover a large area of territory and the empty bomb container would fall to the ground or sometimes unfortunately on somebody's house. Now, more recent methods of delivery, in the, uh, after the war, in the, uh, the 60s and 70s, North and South Korea began using large balloons like this. And here's a picture of a balloon that got caught in some power lines uh, in South Korea in 2016. Sorry about that noise. Uh, so under the balloon, you can see this lump, this bundle. This is a large bundle of leaflets. And that bundle of leaflets was attached to a small explosive. And that explosive was attached to a timer. So when the timer counted down to zero, the explosive would blow up and all the leaflets would scatter from the air down to the ground uh, for maximum dispersal. That's the idea, at least. But sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes balloons get caught in power lines, not where they're supposed to go. Uh, 
And sometimes the timers don't work or the explosives don't work. And we have some examples of that. In 2016, here we can see uh, what used to be a water container on top of somebody's house. And the whole bundle of leaflets fell from a great height without breaking open onto uh, and uh, cracking open the water container and leaving all the leaflets on top of the roof of that house. Uh, that's not how they're intended to go. Sometimes they've also fallen on cars. Here's uh, the roof of a car that was smashed by a giant bundle of leaflets in 2016, and some of them ended up on the ground next to the car. Here's the same thing, but from a different angle, different news outlet. Right, so leaflets were uh, more recently spread by balloons. Now the big question is, and this is really a very important question, are leaflets successful? If, if you're printing two billion leaflets and covering the entire Korean Peninsula with them, you want to know, is your message getting across? Now there were, of course, during the Korean War, many, many thousands of uh, North Koreans and Chinese who uh, did get captured and became prisoners of war. Uh, now, some of them may have done so as a result of reading a leaflet and being convinced that, yeah, I'd be better off in a prisoner of war camp than continuing to fight uh, during these winter months in this very thin uniform. But actually, the answer of whether leaflets are generally successful, it's very much a matter of debate. There doesn't seem to be a lot of agreement on it. We do have um, also more recently anecdotes from North Koreans who say, yeah, I picked up a leaflet in North Korea and that convinced me that I should leave North Korea and come down to South Korea. There are some stories of people who do that, but we don't have large scale statistics. We don't have hundreds or thousands. The, the South Korean government may have those numbers, but it doesn't publicize those numbers. And that's because propaganda and leafleting is controlled by uh, intelligence organizations like the National Intelligence Service or the military intelligence services, and they don't publicize that information. They keep that quiet. There is a, a book called Psy War, which was published in 1992, and that book focused specifically on propaganda efforts during the Korean War, so from 1950 to 1953. Uh, and that author said that more than 100,000 North Korean and Chinese soldiers surrendered as a result of Psy War activities. Uh, oops. Uh, but he doesn't give any details. He doesn't quote a, a paper. Uh, so there's nowhere that I can find more accurate or more detailed information about that. And the point is, I, oh, the, the problem is, when your morale is already low, imagine if you're fighting on the battlefront and it's winter and you're wearing a, a thin uniform uh, and you, your shoes have holes in them and maybe you're running low on food, maybe you don't have many bullets, maybe people in your unit have been shot and killed or injured. At that time, when you see a leaflet saying, give up, come and join uh, the other side or come and be a prisoner of war, we'll treat you nicely, that might be the right time to see a leaflet and that might actually have an effect and convince you. So leaflets may be a factor when the morale is already low, but can a leaflet alone change a strongly held belief? If you pick up a piece of paper that says, don't eat any more sugar, uh, sugar's bad for you, will that have an effect on you if you're a fan of sugar? Probably not. And so similarly, political propaganda leaflets may not have an effect on people who are uh, strongly believing what they've been taught. So what are you supposed to do? Well, this is actually more in the past because it doesn't happen much anymore. But what were you supposed to do if you find a leaflet from the other career? Well, remember that box I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture. Uh, if you're a student, you're supposed to pick up a leaflet, bring it to school, give it to the teacher, and it would go into that box, which would normally have a padlock on it. And then eventually it would go to the local police station. If you're not a student and you pick it up, you're supposed to uh, put it into a, a special box, for example, at National Park. There would be a box there near the gateway where you could pick them, uh, put leaflets in there, or at police stations, or even a post office box. You could simply put it in a mailbox and uh, the postman would collect it and would hand it over to the police. So you're not supposed to keep them. And students, um, you might be wondering, why do I have a picture of a notebook and a ruler here? Well, that's because um, that's the reward. If you're a student, if you pick up a leaflet and give it to your teacher, you would receive a notebook, a ruler, a pencil, some kind of stationary item as a reward, as a sort of a, a thank you for handing in propaganda leaflets to the government. 
Right? And the, the, uh, the ruler and the notebook actually have a message saying, as soon as you see a seditious propaganda leaflet, hand it in or inform somebody about it. It is all covered by the, the rules of the South Korean National Police Act, or the rules for collecting, handling, and monitoring seditious propaganda. Here's some examples of posters that used to be around telling people uh, what to do if you see a leaflet. As soon as you see a leaflet, report on it. And here we see on the left, uh, it looks like uh, an angry blimp spewing forth leaflets onto the ground. And here on the right, you see somebody putting the uh, uh, leaflets into a mailbox. You don't need to put a stamp on it. Just put it in the mailbox and it would find its way to the right people or hand it over to the local police or to a local army unit. Now, why is it dangerous to keep a leaflet? Why, was it, you were supposed, why were people supposed to hand them in? Why couldn't people keep them? That's because in South Korea, in 1948, one of the very first laws, one of the oldest laws in South Korea, is the 1948 National Security Act. And this law forbids the spreading of propaganda or the possession of propaganda that praises uh, a... Uh, and it doesn't specifically say North Korea, but it says praises a government that is antithetical to the government of the Republic of Korea or any organization that is antithetical to the government of South Korea. So under the National Security Act, it actually tells people you can't have these things. Now, we don't know uh, in North Korea what the uh, specific law on this is, but I imagine that there would be a similar law or laws in North Korea that also tell people if you find something from South Korea, you're supposed to hand it in. So it's dangerous to hold on to it because if you hold on to it, the government might think that you're working for the other side. You could be a spy, you could be an agent, you could be a rebel. So leaflets or any form of propaganda are seen as impure and stoking rebellion. Not just here in South Korea, but also in North Korea. So I say in both Koreas there. And at the, at the bottom line here, at the, at the base here, uh, governments in both Koreas don't seem to trust the citizens of their countries to uh, sort out good information from bad information. So the government say, we'll, si we'll simply take all that from you and you won't have to make that distinction. We'll just remove that so you can't look at it. And so it's a kind of spiritual uh, or mental pollution, poisoning the minds of the citizens of the two Koreas. That's also why North Korean websites are uh, blocked. So if you try to go to the website of the Rodong Shinmun, the North Korean state newspaper, or even to Uri Minjokiri, uh, you can't. You get this warning from the South Korean uh, Communications Standards Commission. Even on YouTube, uh, the channel of uh, the, the videos that are produced by the North Korean government, those channels can't be subscribed in South Korea for the same reason. Right? They're, uh, they're blocked off. Now, North Korea, as I said earlier, North Korea goes one step further. It makes the whole internet inaccessible. So if you're a North Korean citizen, you can't even log on and check your email uh, or have a look at your Facebook. You can't do any of those things because the whole internet is blocked in North Korea, except for a very small group of people. People who are working for the North Korean government, they're allowed to have access to the internet. So, what are some recent developments in South Korea? The Constitutional Court last week started to have hearings about whether this National Security Act, the one from 1948, whether it's constitutional or does it uh, block people's freedom of thought, freedom of expression under the Constitution. Now, in the very first hearing, the Justice Ministry strongly defended the National Security Act, saying, yes, it is constitutional. We shouldn't let people have these things or look at these things. So it's still very much a topic of debate in South Korea about whether it's okay to even look at, to even consider uh, messages from the other side. And in North Korea, it's even more strict. Now, leafleting has ended. You will notice walking around in South Korea that you don't see leaflets on the ground anymore. When you go to a national park or a mountainside, you can't find leaflets anymore. So when did it end? 
Actually, quite a while ago, in, tw in 2000, just before the very first inter-Korean summit between Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il, the two Koreas made an agreement to stop slandering each other uh, with various forms of propaganda. So at that time, uh, leafleting stopped, or at least from South Korea, leafleting stopped. Uh, and in 2000, the South Korean National Police Agency scrapped their rules, uh, which means that after 2000, any South Korean student who found a leaflet, even an old one, and handed it in to a police officer or to a teacher wouldn't get the free ruler or free notebook or free pens anymore. That all stopped uh, in 2000. But North Korea kicked off again. They restarted leafleting back in 2013 after the uncle of Kim Jong-un, Jang Song-tek, when he was purged, uh, North Korean leaflets were found on Pengyongdo. And do you know where Pengyongdo is? It's an island far off the coast of Incheon in the, uh, the West Sea between Korea and China. And it is so far from the South Korean mainland that you can actually see uh, it's, it's closer to North Korea from Pengyongdo than it is to the South Korean mainland. So it's really a lonely island out there. You have to take a ferry for four hours uh, from Incheon to get there. Uh, and they found some leaflets there in 2013. And then during the later years of Park Geun-hye's presidency, uh, there were much more leaflets. They really started leaflets again in earnest. And that was probably around the summer of 2015. Uh, in 2015, two South Korean soldiers, very unfortunately, uh, they had their legs blown off by North Korean mines while patrolling near the demilitarized zone. They weren't killed, but they were very seriously injured. Uh, and the South Korean, that's when the South Korean government set up those big uh, loudspeaker arrays. I showed you a photograph of the loudspeakers before. The South Korean government started pumping propaganda, uh, audio propaganda into North Korea at that time. And so North Korea responded by making leaflets and sending them to South Korea. And that's when we had those, uh, the balloons that fell uh, or the, uh, the bundles of leaflets that fell on the water tank and the roofs of cars. And they even continued during the start of President Moon Jae-in's presidency. Uh, right up until the, uh, the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympics, North Korea was sending leaflets here. Uh, with ugly caricatures of Moon Jae-in uh, and, and Donald Trump. Uh, so they were continuing right up until then. And then again, in June 2020, uh, around the time of the, uh, the blowing up of the inter-Korean liaison office in Kaesong, North Korea put out a, a, a photograph on its own state news agency saying, look, we've prepared a lot more leaflets and we're going to send them to South Korea again. It was kind of like a warning to South Korea. They showed this photograph of tens of thousands of leaflets uh, and they were threatening to send them here. Let me just get some water. So you might wonder why. Why would they be? Why would the North Korean government want to send these leaflets here again? And that's because even though the South Korean government no longer sends leaflets, South Korean civic groups now send leaflets. The most ex famous example of that is a man by the name of Park sang Hak. He himself used to be uh, a North Korean. He came from North Korea as a refugee to South Korea. So he's a, South Co he's a North Korean defector. Uh, he's a democracy activist. He wants to basically uh, bring down the government of North Korea and bring about regime change in North Korea to free the people of North Korea. And so he has this group called the Fighters for a Free North Korea. And they make their own leaflets and they send them up with balloons showing uh, giant anti-Kim Jong-un uh, slogans and they send them into North Korea and this makes the North Korean government really angry. They hate these leaflets. In fact, the North Korean government doesn't like information flows coming in from outside. That's one of the reasons why they block the whole internet in North Korea. Right? Uh, so South Korean civic groups sending leaflets, that's now illegal. Right. The uh, Development of Inter-Korean Relations Act, that was amended at the end of 2020, uh, and it, it's now kind of known unofficially as the anti-leaflet law, uh, and that specifically forbids the sending of leaflets or printouts or even money, and I, I mention money because, or the law mentions money, because Park sang hak and his groups would sometimes often send in uh, US dollar bills together with the leaflets to encourage people to pick them up, because money is good. Uh, leaflet could be dangerous, but people will often pick them both up together. Uh, 
uh, or electronic storage devices. And that's mentioned because they were sending in USBs. USBs, sometimes a USB might contain a propaganda movie, uh, sometimes it might contain all of Wikipedia downloaded onto a USB disk. Right? So they were sending in USBs. So all of that is now banned under this anti-leafleting law. And what happens if you do it? You could be fined up to 30 million won. And so there are people in South Korea now, including Park sung hak who are under investigation or under indictment or under prosecution for uh, sending leaflets without the permission of the South Korean government. So what we see here is that the two Koreas very much believe that uh, it's only the governments that should be sending propaganda to and from uh, across the border to the other side. It's not civic groups or individuals or citizens who should be sending messages. And in fact, similarly, uh, under South Korean law, uh, it's illegal for a South Korean to contact a person in North Korea. So you can't send them an email, you can't send them a postcard or call them up uh, or even meet them in a third country. That's all. Uh, without permission, that's all forbidden. And here's a, a recent story just a few days ago from my colleague Kim Jong-min over at NK News that the Ministry of Unification is actually urging activists, people like Park sung hak to stop sending anti-North Korean leaflets. And uh, this is actually uh, a giant poster. You'll see the man, that's Park sung hak underneath. So this is not a leaflet, this is a giant poster. The poster goes in the balloon and hangs quite high in the air so that people can see the poster uh, from many angles and then the leaflets and the money and the USB sticks hang underneath there. And in fact, more recently, Park sung hak has been sending um, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, vitamin C and face masks into North Korea. Why? Because the North Korean government's response to the COVID pandemic hasn't been great and so Park sung hak is basically sending in a kind of a, a citizen's COVID relief supply uh, into North Korea. So that also is something that the Unification Ministry doesn't want him to do. So they're basically saying, please don't do that. And the reason is, this is the, uh, the government's reason is, if civic groups send leaflets to North Korea, the North Korean government has threatened to shoot into South Korean territory, to basically shell uh, those places where the leaflets have been sent from. Right? And uh, so they make, the government makes it a security issue saying, look, it's not safe. The farmers on the border there in Paju, in Yonchon, in Pochon, uh, those farmers are in danger. If you send leaflets, they might get their houses shelled, so please don't send leaflets. So, leaflet formats. Here's an example of, this is a kind of a, a test leaflet made sometime during the Korean War, showing uh, basically the idea is that people would walk around, they'd see a leaflet, they'd stop and pick it up, and then they would read the leaflet, and in this case, because it's a test leaflet, it says, keep this leaflet until somebody comes to collect it from you. So some leaflets are mostly or exclusively text, it's just writing, visually it's quite boring. Some of them have a photo and some text together, having a hybrid nature, like a comic book in a way. Some of them have realistic drawings to evoke emotions. This is quite what I would call a realistic drawing. And some of them have cartoons and caricatures, especially uh, of the leaders of the other side, to make the leaders look silly uh, or weak. Now, what are some typical themes of leaflets? First one is praise this Korea. So if it's a South Korean leaflet, it'll say something good about South Korea. That seems obvious. So a North Korean leaflet will say something good about North Korea. Denigrate the other Korea. So a leaflet might say the other Korea is no good. Or it could show the lives of defectors, people who cross the border. Right. During the, uh, the period from 1953 up until 1990, there were a lot of North Korean soldiers who crossed into South Korea, and there were even some South Korean soldiers who crossed into North Korea. And so the leaflets would say, look at these guys, they've done the right thing, they've crossed over, they're living good lives. And of course, also personal attacks on the leaders of the other Korea. And that was very popular, uh, well, even when uh, Park Geun-hye was president, many of the leaflets were specifically directed at her. 
an appeal to pride or tradition. So, for example, during Chuseok time, during the Korean War, there were leaflets about Chuseok. Uh, during Deborum, there were leaflets about Deborum. So they would appeal to tradition saying, you know, think about what Korea used to be like and appealing to that. And another really interesting theme is false flag. Now, what's a false flag? Well, a false flag is when you, you make a leaflet here. At the, the South Korean government made a leaflet in South Korea, but it pretends to be made by people in North Korea. Right, so when you read the leaf, you think, oh, somebody here on this side made this leaflet. But no, it's actually made by the other side, uh, and it pretends to be made on your side. And I'll show you an example of a, a false flag leaflet from both sides in a moment. What can we learn from leaflets? Well, what I've learned by looking at them is you learn about incidents in the history of both careers. I've learned a lot of, of little interesting things that people don't talk about or have forgotten about uh, that were recorded on these leaflets. For example, uh, last month, in August, I wrote for the first time in my life a text-based story for NK News, and it was about the very first North Korean citizen who was charged with a crime in a U.S. court of law. He was a, uh, a North Korean diplomat working at the mission to the United Nations in New York, uh, and he attacked a woman in a park, and he was uh, charged with that crime. Now, that's almost completely forgotten now. It's uh, part of history, uh, and so I thought, wow, I only learned about this because I read a leaflet that had been posted up on the internet. And so I ended up writing an article about it, how the first North Korean to face charges in US triggered a diplomatic standoff. Right, if I hadn't seen that leaflet online, I wouldn't have known about it. So let's have a look at some historical leaflets. And these are examples that I have found on the Twitter account, Korean Underbar Leaflets. So if you're interested, you can find more of them there. Here is an example of a leaflet put, uh, produced by the United Nations during the Korean War. So this is one of the oldest leaflets uh, from 1950. And you can see, you can maybe just make out here, uh, this is a map of Korea. And here we have Incheon and we have the ships coming into Incheon. So this is a, a leaflet about the successful Incheon landing when Douglas MacArthur brought hundreds of thousands of men and uh, many, many ships to Incheon to change the course of the war. And so the text here uh, from top to bottom says the UN forces have finally landed at Incheon. And it's interesting to see that the uh, Chinese characters for Incheon were used rather than the Hangul. This is the back of that same leaflet, and this is an example of completely text. It's all text. And back then, you would read top to bottom, right to left. So here's the message. Officers and men of the North Korean army, powerful allied forces have landed in Incheon. They are moving forward rapidly. You can see your situation is desperate by looking at the map drawn on the back. Look, your supply lines have been cut. The road to retreat is also blocked. Your reinforcements can't, reinforcements can't come. And at the same time, you can't retreat to the north. Of the 59 countries in the United Nations, you are fighting against 53 of them. It's not really accurate, but anyway. You will lose against this overwhelming force. You can never overcome UN materiel, troops, and firepower. To continue to resist is to choose death. So, your choice is simple. The only way is to come over to the UN side or die. So defect to the UN. Then they will give you plenty of food and treat your injuries. Right, so it's a very uh, simple message, but a clear one. We're stronger, you're not going to win, come over to the other side. But it's quite long, and you might ask yourself, if you're a soldier and you're in the heat of battle, do you have time to pick up a leaflet and read a text as long as this? It, it might be a bit of a stretch. The number 702, you can just make out here in the bottom right here, every leaflet had a number. Right? Uh, every pr production, uh, there was a production number, so there was a whole series of leaflets, and that's just a way of the, uh, the producers keeping track of which number uh, that leaflet was. So this is from September 1950. Here, on the other hand, is a leaflet from North Korea. This is one that's mostly in English, although you'll also see some Korean there as well. And why do they produce leaflets in English? 
Well, this is to try to convince the soldiers on the UN side that you should give up, stop fighting, and come over. Right? And so this is pretending to be a, a letter by a, pr a prisoner of war, perhaps an American prisoner of war, whoops, because he says, I'm extremely happy in my favorable situation now, and here no longer will I fight for the interests of the imperialists, which have nothing in common with the interests of the American people. And that's uh, written by a Herbert M. Romberger. Right, so, uh, I don't know whether that's a real person, but anyway, they're using photographs and a text to try to convince other soldiers on the American side to switch over. And this is the back of that same leaflet. Officers and men of the U.S. forces came over to the Korean People's Army seeking to save their lives. And here it has another letter at the bottom uh, purporting to be from another prisoner of war. This has a number two, 205198. Right, so both sides were really trying to, uh, to convince each other. There were also leaflets in Chinese made by the United Nations to convince the Chinese soldiers. Right, so they were produced in at least three languages, English, Korean, and Chinese. Here's an example with a cartoon. This is number 1242, the landlord and his slave and his ox. And we see in the background there is Joseph Stalin. He's actually labeled in case you don't recognize him. And then we see Mao Zedong. And in front we see Kim Il-sung. And here they've taken this logo, which if you're young you may not recognize, but this was the, the logo of uh, the Soviet Union of international communism, the hammer and the sickle. And they've turned that logo into a plow. And Mao Zedong is driving Kim Il-sung like an ox to plow the field. And in the background is Stalin laughing and watching, very proud of what's going on. Right, very uh, simple and direct and impactful because it's got a picture, it's got a cartoon, it's labeled, the letters are big, so it's quick and easy to read. On the back, a much longer text. But we do have, again, a cartoon at the top. And this is interesting because this theme we see in a number of leaflets. We see at the back Stalin pushing Mao, pushing a Chinese soldier, pushing a Korean soldier right, into the firing line, into the war. The similar theme was used on leaflets for uh, Chinese soldiers. In that case, the Korean at the front was missing. It was simply Stalin pushing Mao, pushing a Chinese soldier into the, uh, the line of fire. So that theme was used quite a bit. And here we have uh, uh, the explanation of, uh, or rather the translation of the letter. Uh, and at the bottom, we see, get rid of Kim Il-sung, who is like an ox, oppose communism to the death. A very common message there to people, uh, sent to people in North Korea. So this is a leaflet from the United Nations. Now we're going fast forward in time, way forward. We're skipping the 60s and 70s. We're into 1983 now. Here is an example where a, a South Korean leaflet actually uses the cover of a magazine. This is a real magazine, The Spectator, and this is the 12th of March 1983 issue of The Spectator where the uh, uh, succession from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-il is parodied. And uh, the South Koreans thought, oh, that's a good excuse. We'll use that magazine, make a leaflet out of it, and send it into North Korea. So the translation there, the sight of Kim father and son, a global laughing stock. British Weekly magazine lampoons the Kim father to son succession. And on the back of this leaflet, you see pictures of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il statues lined up, saying Kim Jong-il statues, as if competing against each other to be erected. Uh, Kim Il-sung, Kim, jo uh, Kim Jong-il. Kim Il-sung father and son quit playing deification games, basically that means making yourself into gods, erecting statues of living people, and give food and clothes to your hungry naked people. So it's a, a message here, basically, it sounds like it's talking to the leaders, but really it's talking to the people of North Korea, encouraging them to rise up and overthrow the regime. Meanwhile, the North Koreans were busy doing something very similar. Here they made a caricature of then President John Doo Hwan, and this is probably around February 1981, uh, because there was a, an election around that time. And so here we have the Democratic Justice Party presidential candidate, and here they do a play on words. They're making a pun here, basically. Instead of John Doo Hwan, they're writing Jol Doo Hwan, which means beheading Han, cutting off his head. So it's a play on words of John Doo Hwan. And he says here on the sign around his neck, I showed how good I am in Gwangju. 
And of course, in Guangzhou, uh, unfortunately, many demonstrators and, and students and young people there were killed or injured or beaten up or arrested. I showed how good I am in Guangzhou. I will show my skills again in the future, so please give me your vote. And here we see a sword going through the media, publishing, demonstrations and rally political parties and organizations. So basically showing how John Dehuan is, is, was at that time uh, destroying the freedoms of South Korean people. And the back, we see, this is the same leaflet. Look at the, uh, the this is still written in the old uh, top to bottom, right to left form. Here, at the bottom left, we have a group name. This is supposedly the organization that made this leaflet, the voice of the Somin. And the Somin means the, the, uh, the, the, the people of the lower classes in Korea, the poorer people, the simple people. So this is a false flag leaflet because it pretends to be produced within South Korea by a South Korean group, but it's clearly a North Korean leaflet. Uh, again, encouraging people to rise up and to overthrow the government of South Korea. And so both Koreas were doing this kind of message uh, in both directions. And then, uh, here's an example of uh, a historical incident that I'd never heard of. I only found out about that by reading this one on that Twitter account. A Chinese passenger plane made an emergency landing in South Korea after flying over Pyongyang. And this is in, on uh, May 5th in 1983, a Chinese passenger plane carrying 105 people from Shenyang, up in the northeast of China, was on its way to Shanghai, but it was hijacked uh, and uh, brought to South Korea. And according to the hijack captain, the plane circled Pyongyang five times, sending a hijacking emergency signal to, now note our, that means the North Korean Air Force. And flying in the Republic's airspace, that means North Korea's airspace, for an hour and 70 minutes. But our Air Force was completely unaware of it. So it sounds like it's a North Korean writing a complaint about the North Korean government. Again, it's a false flag leaflet. Right. And so it's taking an incident, it's taking this hijacking of a Chinese plane and uh, flying to South Korea, and it's making that an issue within North Korea. Uh, and it actually mentions another incident. It's not that long since Captain Ri Ung Pyong, serving in our Air Force's first pursuit group, flew a MiG-19 to South Korea, and now something like this happens again? So, the party leaders and aviation officials whose bellies are filled with the blood of the people must be severely punished in the name of the people. So trying to make people angry at their government. I mentioned before that there were defectors, soldiers from both sides, crossing over. So here's an example of a leaflet saying, welcome. Welcome to Pyongyang. And we have some photographs of South Korean soldiers and also um, a, two South Korean university students and a South Korean reporter who crossed the border and defected into North Korea. And so this leaflet is saying, you're all welcome here. Uh, that there are people following, they're coming from different positions. Some of them are um, uh, officers in the army, some are civilians, and some are conscripts, but they're all welcome and they're all following the sun with the same heart. Okay, that's the back of that. Here's the exact same thing uh, in South Korea. They're saying, look at these North Korean soldiers who have come over. Isn't it wonderful? And giving a list to them. And then on the back of that leaflet, it's quite a lot of text, but in the bottom left, we see it says how much money and how much gold and what kind of apartment people can get if they cross over. So say basically, uh, come over and we'll give you all of this. And including... Uh, free tuition. Not sure if that was free tuition here at college, but free tuition somewhere. <laughs> and then here, uh, in 1984, we've got, these are all foreigners at the bottom, showing their love and appreciation for Kim Jong-il's many books, and some quotes from foreign leaders saying how wonderful it is, uh, the things that Kim Jong-il says. And then here, the last one I've got is from the late 1990s, early 2000s, the South Korean leaflet, showing how great development is in Seoul. So you see Namsan Tower in the back, the happy South Korean family, the South Korean flag. Even if you can fool the ears of the people, you can't fool the rhyme. On the back of that leaflet, we have uh, the scene of an oil rig being built in South Korea, saying we are now the world's second largest shipbuilding industry. So it's a, a theme of development saying life really is better over here. Okay, where can you go to learn more? Uh, over in the northeast of Korea, in Kangwon province, 
just at the demilitarisome, there is a, a demilitarisome museum, and they put together a book uh, about propaganda leaflets of North and South Korea. It's an inquiry only. If you're interested, you can email this man, uh, and he'll send you a PDF of it. Also, uh, the Seoul Museum of History, they've got a, a book about leaflets too, that if you're interested, you can actually download that easily uh, as a PDF from the website. So, conclusions. All governments use messaging to persuade insiders and outsiders. And citizens, you should be aware and use critical thinking. And over here, throughout history, since 1948, both Koreas have used various forms of propaganda over the years to influence not only their own people, but each other's people. And we can learn interesting things about modern Korean history by studying propaganda. That brings me to the end. Uh, here you can find the podcast that I mentioned to you before at nknews.org. I welcome now your questions and answers. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your very insightful, fascinating presentations on, on the use of propaganda by the two careers. Uh, sharing all your insights through the research and the writing that you've done. Absolutely fascinating. Um, we have some questions for our students, so uh, please. Uh, Christine, so first. Um, I believe my question was like sort of answered throughout the presentation, but what do you think is the primary reason for the halt of the fierce propaganda war during the like um, in the past, whereas in the status quo, like there's not much propaganda leaflets like you like mentioned before. So why do you think that's like the major reason why it's like all stops now, despite like the still there's still tension between the two Koreas? So do you think it's the reason that like we're stopping it and we're just putting it? I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing you. Um... So Christine is asking. Obviously, there's still tension between the, the two countries. What do you think perhaps caused the stop of the propaganda leaflets moving forward with regards to that? Uh, what caused the, the, the stopping of the leaflets? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, since 1972, North and South Korea have had various cycles of uh, coming together for talks and then getting uh, angry with each other and they're not talking for a while and then coming together for talks and they're not talking for a while. So in 2000, that was a time when uh, it was possible for the two Koreas to talk again during the Sunshine Policy era of uh, President Kim Dae-jong. Uh, and so it was important before the two leaders met for the summit in Pyongyang that they stop uh, slandering each other and trying to, uh, to convince people to, uh, to cross over to the other side. And so that, at that point, they stopped the, uh, the broadcasters. They also had these giant lights, like simple LED uh, displays. Uh, shining letters into the, uh, into the demilitarized zone, they stopped that. So that was a, in a period where things were trying to get better. And then in 2018, when we had the, uh, the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, again, the two Koreas were coming closer and they were having dialogue, and that's where the North Koreans agreed to, uh, to stop uh, sending leaflets again. So it is possible that in the future, North Korea may begin that again. I mean, now we're in one of those periods where the two Koreas are not talking to each other, uh, and where North Korea sometimes says very angry things uh, about the South Korean government or the South Korean president. So they may begin that again. It does seem at this stage unlikely that South Korea would begin that again, because I think South Korea feels that uh, the, the use Usefulness of, of leafleting uh, has has, out, has been outlived, and so they're just not likely to start that again. They could, I mean, it doesn't never say never, uh, but it doesn't seem that that's likely. Thanks for your question. Um, so, as you said in the talk, now the civic groups who are sending leaflets over to North Korea are now illegal. I mean, they're not supported by the government. But do you think it, there was a point in time where? These groups were secretly funded or endorsed by the South Korean government. Uh, could you repeat that, please? The, the civic groups were sending over leaflets to North Korea. Do you think that there was a point in time where they were secretly funded or endorsed by the Korean government, the South Korean government? Oh, the civic groups? Yeah. Um, no, I, I haven't seen any sign of that. Even uh, 20 years ago, during the, uh, the presidency of Noh Mu Hyun, there were civic groups then, uh, democracy activists, who were sending balloons into, uh, into North Korea, and the police actively tried to stop them, and there were some scuffles near the border where they tried to send them off. Now, 
Of course, um, you know, politics comes in cycles. So after Norman Hunt, we had um, uh, Im Young Bak and then Papineer. Now, during those years, I didn't see any sign that they were being actively supported or uh, funded by the South Korean government. But it is probably the case that the South Korean government was a little bit lighter in enforcing the rules at that time and wasn't so active in trying to stop civic groups from sending leaflets. So uh, now, uh, Interesting, now we've had a political shift in South Korea from the Moon Jae-in government to the Yoon Song-yeol government. Both of those governments, as we saw before, both of those governments seem to be quite firm on trying to stop it for security reasons. So, I, I, but I haven't seen any example that they ever got money or, or, or active support. Thank you for your question. Okay, uh, Oscar is next. We've, got some, we've actually had some questions submitted first and then we're gonna open it floor afterwards, so yeah. So if we'll do Oscar first, and then we'll open it up. I, I wonder if it's possible to, to momentarily lower the mask while asking the question. It might make it easier for me to hear. In your opinion, what was the most effective form of propaganda used by either side? Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, the most effective form of propaganda. Hmm. I think it's, it's really, it's most effective when um, when you don't realize that it's a message coming from the other side, or that you when, the most effective propaganda is when you don't realize that it's propaganda. So uh, the comic books that I showed earlier are a really a super effective way of, of teaching kids the worldview that they will later grow up with, to uh, hate and fear the Americans and the Japanese and only trust uh, the North Koreans and their leaders and, and to uh, be very distrustful of South Korea. That, it, it seems to be, uh, a very effective way of messaging. It's messaging in a fun way through a comic book. You know, it seems quite innocuous, and yet it, it has this uh, this powerful political message that will last for decades throughout your whole lifetime. Thanks for the question. So the DPRK during the Cold War, they depicted the Korean race as kind of like the purest race. So did the North Koreans view their South Korean brethren as racially inferior or just as equals infested by foreign influence? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, a good question there. Look, uh, in some of the leaflets that I didn't show, um, uh, we'll see uh, South Korean leaders as being uh, weak and servile in front of the Americans. So you'll see, for example, uh, President uh, North Teo on his knees offering a, a tray of, of bribes and, and good things to American President Bush. So we see that kind of image of uh, the South as being weak and inferior and very much subservient to, uh, to American interests. They don't, interestingly, uh, the race card doesn't seem to get played much in the least, not the one that I've seen at least. Uh, there have been instances where oh, uh, conversations where North and South Korean um, officials were together and the North Koreans have said, you know, uh, you South Koreans, you're bringing in all these immigrants and you have uh, Koreans marrying non-Koreans and, and we don't think that's a good thing. But I haven't seen that actually as a theme used in leaflets, uh, just in, uh, in conversation. So, but the, the theme of, of being uh, polluted by or, uh, or weaker than the West is very much used in a lot of the leaflets yeah, so you'll see uh, in the, the recent ones in 2015, 2016, we saw Park Geun Hye um, acting like a um, uh, like a, a, a plaything for uh, uh, pri then Prime Minister Abe and uh, and President Obama. So that that's a, a theme that does come up very much. Yeah. Uh, our last submitted one is by David, who I think is just there. There we go. Very happy, David. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask if um, you thought it was like morally wrong or right to like use propaganda to influence like citizens in other countries. In other countries? Yes, like in general. Uh, are you asking for my moral judgment? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, well, is it... Mm, Probably not, because really, as I said at the very beginning there, it's not just government, it's also corporations that seek to influence us all the time. So let's take um, uh, a soft drink company, let's take Coca-Cola as an example. 
Coca-Cola is an, a, an American company that sells its drink all over the world, and it also advertises that drink all over the world. So if I say that it's morally wrong for a government of country A to try to convince people in country B about something, then I should also say that it's wrong for a company from country A to advertise its products or to give its message to people in company B. So I think it's, it's just a normal fact of life that uh, companies and governments seek to influence not only their own people, but also outside groups. And so we just have to be aware of that and to uh, use our critical thinking and make our own decisions. Um, should we open the floor to any other questions? If you've got a question, raise your hand and we will walk around. Have you ever been to North Korea? I have visited North Korea a total of four times. Uh, and there, they, it, it's interesting, most of the really ugly propaganda you're not able, if you're in North Korea as a visitor, you're not able to see that. You just see very um, simple kind of messages, like the, the poster I showed before, for example, of, uh, with the, the COVID mask and the, and the has chemic, uh, hazmat suit. Um, those kinds of public health posters and things you can see in North Korea, but you don't really see much propaganda. Although the comic books, uh, they are available uh, for looking at in North Korea. So. It's a place that's really full of, of very visible propaganda. Even the buildings have signs on top of them with slogans saying things like Ish and Dangyo, the single-minded unity, or uh, let's carry out the um, uh, let's carry out the orders of the Sixth Party Congress. You know, very uh, not very interesting stuff, but these are actually written on the tops of buildings for people to see. So you can't avoid it wherever you go in North Korea. It's everywhere. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Um, what happened to the leaflets after uh, you give it to the police station and people? Okay, yeah, good question. So what happens to leaflets after we hand them in to, uh, to the police station? Now, um, the police, uh, within the police, there is a, a team or a, a unit that works on intelligence issues, so looking for uh, communist spies or communist agents or investigating communist propaganda, and so uh, it's their job to analyze this and to put it into some kind of a, a catalog. They may then hand it over to the National Intelligence Service, which is tasked with doing that on a national basis. Uh, after that, I imagine they destroy most of them, but they keep a copy of each one uh, in some kind of a folder or a book so that they know which ones have been produced and how many were found and where they were found. All this kind of data goes into, uh, uh, into a database. But as I said, the, uh, the intelligence services don't share that information, so they don't make it public. So it's actually quite rare. Um, the, the two examples that I gave of the, the DMZ Museum in Boson County, uh, and the Seoul History Museum, to actually show these leaflets and explain about them is really rare. They don't do that very often. So, and that's obviously done with the permission of the National Police or the National Intelligence Services. So they have a huge database of all these things, uh, and then the rest, they just destroy them. Um, so I think there were times that North Korea was more um, richer than South Korea, and South Korea is more rich, richer than North Korea, but like, is there like a correlation to how effective the propaganda is depending on how rich the country is and like how the number of leaflets sent is like increased due to like South Korea being more uh, more richer or like North Korea being more, more richer? Is there like a correlation? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. And that goes back to the point that I made earlier about the, uh, the effectiveness, effectiveness of leaflets in general. If your morale is already low, if you're already feeling bad about something, then you might be tempted to, uh, to come across the other side. So the wealth, of, the overall wealth of a country certainly does play into that. Um, it, although it, it's interesting, uh, when in 2016, when there were those demonstrations against President Patronet here in Seoul, um, North Korea was sending a lot of leaflets with similar messages, but it's interesting how few of those were uh, picked up and spread and shared by, by South Korean people. South Korean people look at them and think immediately, oh, this is just North Korea, and they throw that away, uh, and they, they, they continue with their demonstrations against President Park. So even though the messages were aligned, there was very little interest or very little buy-in from the South Koreans. So I think that the, the overall wealth and also just confidence, uh, you know, I think that, the South Koreans, I personally
personally think the South Korean government shouldn't be too worried about people looking at this propaganda and being affected by it because South Korea has basically won the propaganda war. South Korea has developed and has become uh, a modern, uh, healthy and, and successful nation with a, a strong and robust democracy uh, that even when the, the people go out there and, uh, and call for the impeachment of a president, they're not you know, getting into an armed rebellion or some kind of an uprising. So I think that the Really, over the years, we've seen very, very little effect here in South Korea, uh, and that may be very strongly related to the uh, the wealth and the uh, just the confidence of the country as it develops. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Do you believe that most of the media um, presented in both Korea is mostly just black and white, or has there ever been an instance where they don't necessarily represent the other Korea as like terrible? Like not, like not completely black and white between the Koreas? Yeah, yeah I, I think that given that um, each leaflet or each propaganda message, you have to try to get your message across in the shortest space uh, possible. Uh, there really isn't a lot of room for nuance or shades of grey. That there, Generally, the government's trying to present message in a very, very simplistic black and white way uh, that without a lot of nuance because you've got to get that message across within 30 seconds. If people look at it and they think, oh, this is too much text, I haven't got, I haven't got time for this, they'll throw it away. So the messages are very simplistic, very black and white, very good or bad, right or wrong, this career or that career. There's no career in the middle. You've got to choose this career or that one. So that, that's uh, generally the way. Did, I, did that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. How do you think that the Korean propaganda war differs from the use of propaganda in other countries, such as Russia or Germany during the Berlin dispute? Oh yeah, great. Okay. Um, I have seen uh, some examples of, uh, of East German propaganda. Now, East and West Germany, as far as I know, there wasn't really a lot of leafleting done between the East and West Germans. Um, and most of that propaganda was from the East to the West. There was a certain time, I think in the 1960s, perhaps when Konrad Adenauer was, was the Chancellor of, Germany, that, of West Germany, that West Germany um, decided that it didn't need to, to actively push propaganda, that simply the success of West Germany was enough. And then later on, there was, um, you, you might call it a sort of accidental propaganda, when East German people started watching West German television. Now, in the case of the North Korean radio stations, they were actively targeting South Korea, but West German television was never actively targeting East Germany, it was simply West German television, and East Germans could watch it on their TVs, uh, and some town, some place in East Germany, they couldn't get West German television, and they were upset and, and, and wanted to have access to it. So it was kind of a very um, effective propaganda without being intentional propaganda. Now, on the East German side, they were producing uh, books and posters and, and doing lots of things to try to convince people uh, on the West side uh, without a lot of success. I mean, there were always some West Germans who would cross over to the East each year. Uh, and, and when, but the number was always greatly outweighed by the number of East Germans crossing over into West Germany each year. And even once people left East Germany to West Germany, uh, the East German government would continue to try to win them back, so it would contact their families and put pressure on their families to call up their defector in, in West Germany and say, hey, uh, your mother's sick, you should come home, or, uh, you know, things are really better and, uh, you know, um, or, or things are really bad now, we want you to come back, you know. So, uh, so wherever there are two competing countries, so North and South Korea, East and West Germany, you're always going to find some forms of propaganda, but it certainly wasn't as big an industry as it has been uh, in Korea over the decades. Thanks for your question. Um, did South Korea ever produce any propaganda graphic novels or literature um, like North Korea did? Yeah, uh, South Korea had a uh, complicated relationship with comic books. During the 50s and 60s, there were times when uh, the, the very 
uh, format of a comic book was seen as being something bad by the South Korean government. So there were actually some instances where there were comic book burnings in South Korea, and people were uh, encouraged to, to uh, hand in their comic books. Uh, but that, that ended in the 1960s. And there were some comic books that are clearly, um, I could think of one example, I forgot the title of it now, but there was one just after Syngman Rhee was thrown out of the presidency of South Korea. It was a, a serialized South Korean comic book that shows the lives of um, simple people, uh, poor South Koreans living next to Chonggechon before the Chonggechon was completely covered up. And one of the, uh, the boys is, um, uh, his mother comes from North Korea, from Hanum, and she's actually a, a, a communist spy, and so the, there are spy hunting elements in there too. So yeah, there were, there were some propaganda themes in South Korea, but that was quickly um, dropped in favor of commercial interests. So in the 1980s and 1990s, the most popular comic books were those that, that told stories about you know, baseball, for example, and, uh, or other things. So comic, comic as, uh, as a form of propaganda wasn't long lived in South Korea. Thank you for your speech. Uh, you mentioned about uh, that some South Koreans defected up to North Korea. Right. Why do you think they did that, and how are they doing right now? Yeah, uh, I haven't looked into all of the individual cases, but there have been at least some cases. I think one of the students mentioned the belief that I showed earlier. Uh, he was in some kind of legal trouble. He had had uh, he had stolen. Um, one of those agricultural tillers that you see out there in the countryside, the two wheels with the, uh, the motor, he'd stolen one, and, uh, and he had, I think, left the army, the South Korean army, uh, gone AWOL. Uh, and so I think he felt that was his only chance for a good life was to get out of South Korea and go to North Korea. So in some cases, that was um, what happened. In the case of, of South Korean army officers who defected, I'm not really sure why, but even the um, the founder of uh, modern taekwondo, uh, whose name escapes me right now, he uh, he didn't defect to North Korea, but he went to live in Canada and then visited North Korea a number of times and became quite friendly with Kim Il Sung. And they set up an alternative uh, taekwondo federation in Pyongyang, the uh, the ITF, the International Taekwondo Federation. And he did that specifically because he said he was tired of the um, uh, the dictatorial uh, Park Chung Hee regime. So that was his uh, reason for going there. So I guess everyone's got their own reasons. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the end of 2020, North Korea has uh, introduced an uh, anti-socialist act, um, whereby North Korean people are not allowed to practice uh, uh, Western lifestyle, or to that extent that they are not allowed to dress like South Korean or uh, using the South Korean phrases. Um, in this uh, against the back, this backdrop, um, how do, do you think the effectiveness of the K-pop or K-content to be used as a, a propaganda tools against uh, North Korea? And second, my second question is: uh, uh, We are aware about uh, North Korea. Uh, has been threatening to launch its uh, seventh uh, weapon nuclear, and the international community is now guessing or calculating just a matter of time where it will happen. Do you think North Korean statement is just uh, propaganda, or they are really ready to launch one? Um, you, you mean a, a seventh nuclear test? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So to answer your first question, um, yeah. At the end of 2020, North Korea made a new law that uh, specifically forbids North Korean people from uh, dressing, talking, or acting like South Koreans. And, and yeah, I think that does show that uh, entertainment uh, is more effective as a means of propaganda, uh, almost like with the, the East Germans watching West German television, it's almost like an unintentional propaganda that uh, South Korean cultural products that have some popularity in North Korea, right? That even without the South Korean government trying, that there are DVDs and USB sticks circulating around inside North Korea with uh, K-dramas and K-pop uh, songs and music videos 
on them. So uh, yeah, th there's definitely some effectiveness to it, and, and this law has a is a clear response to that that effectiveness and that popularity of it. The North Korean government is concerned by what it sees as sort of spiritual pollution uh, coming in from South Korea, and, and it, it's very angry. Just as it was angry with um, with loudspeakers and with the civic groups sending leaflets. Yeah. Uh, to your second question. It's a bit outside the topic, but whether the North Korea would actually do a seventh nuclear test, um, I'm sure that physically, I mean practically, it's capable it could do so. The question is, is now the right time? And we've got the, uh, the Chinese Party Congress coming up that may or may not give Xi Jinping another five years. This is not the time that North Korea wants to uh, make China unhappy, and China generally has expressed very clearly that it's not happy with North Korea doing nuclear tests, especially when it's, uh, it takes attention from Beijing. So uh, uh, I, I don't think that we'll be seeing a, a nuclear test before the end of this year. But I'm not an expert in that. Just, that's just my kill. Okay, we'll have one more question, please. Yes. Mini, 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 mo. Boxes of paper. Um, so, what were the uh, earliest forms of propaganda like, and how were they different from um, propaganda used in the modern day? Yeah, what was the first one? What, 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 was the... what were the earliest forms of um, propaganda used like? Ah, okay. You mean in, in human history or in Korea specifically? Well, I suppose human history. Um. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, since, since propaganda is simply uh, messaging and sending out a message and trying to convince people, uh, there's always been some form of propaganda. I guess you could consider um, uh, sending out a religious message. That's also a form of messaging. Uh, so uh, teaching and preaching and evangelism, that's also a form of messaging. Now, people would not use the word propaganda for that generally, but it, it's a similar activity in that it's I believe something, now I'm going to teach you to believe it. Or I have this uh, conviction, now I'm going to give you that conviction. So oral uh, messaging has always been the, uh, the oldest form of propaganda, just people teaching each other something. Uh, in terms of uh, a physical form of propaganda, it, uh, I looked at a bit of history when I was preparing this presentation. Uh, leafleting was even used as far back in uh, 1871 during the Franco-Prussian War that uh, there were um, hot air balloons that went up and scattered uh, leaflets over the city of Paris, basically convincing people to, uh, to give up uh, and to, uh, to stop fighting against the Prussians. So, so some form of, of uh, physical leafleting has been going on for uh, about 150 years now. Uh, to varying degrees of success. But the earliest form of propaganda is definitely one person telling another person, hey, uh, try and persuade them. This is what I believe, you should believe it too. Okay, I think that's where we'll, uh, we'll stop there. <laughs>